Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Krishna Rajgopal uh, from MIT to uh, deliver this IMSE Diamond Jubilee Distinguished Lecture. And uh, let me just briefly introduce him for people who don't know him already. He's, of course, very well known uh, to everyone. But uh, Professor Rajgopal is a William A.M. Burden Professor of Physics at MIT. He obtained his PhD at Princeton University in 1993 and subsequently spent three years at Harvard as a junior fellow. He then spent one year at Caltech before joining MIT as a faculty member in 97. He became the associate head of the Department of Physics in 2009, served as a chair of the MIT faculty from 2015 to 17, and um, as MIT's dean for digital learning from 2017 to 2021. So it'll be uh, good to hear his experiences sometime, maybe over tea later. Among his many laurels, Professor Raj Gopal was elected as a fellow of the American Physical Society uh, in 2004 for seminal contributions to the theory of dense matter, including color, flavor locked, and crystalline phases of color superconducting quark matter. I was about to say dark matter, but it's quark matter and critical phenomena in heavy ion collisions. He's also interested in combining techniques from gauge gravity duality and uh, perturbative QCD to understand about the interactions of jet with quark gluon plasma. So he has worked ex extensively as you can see in this area. And uh, I always remember his talks as being very clear. And so I'm sure we can look forward to that this time also. And it's really a pleasure to welcome him here to deliver the colloquium today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Srihari, for this um, very generous introduction. And thank you to all of you for the invitation. It's, it's for me, a, a real privilege to help celebrate, um, where is it? I'm SC at 60, right there. And if I remember where it was, right there. Um, and uh, I will be speaking about heavy ion collisions, what next? But I'm going to actually start by telling you my indirect connection to IMSC and why, for me, um, helping to celebrate its 60th birthday is a particular uh, honor. Um, so my connection is through Aladi, um, who uh, all of you know was the founder of IMSC, founded IMSC in 1962. Uh, my connection is not me myself. I certainly never met Aladi myself, but. My father was Aladi's student from 1958 to 60. Um, so uh, my dad was born in 1930 and graduated in 1950 from Loyola College with uh, an MA in math. At that time, at least for my father in 1950, there was really no path upwards. Um, and uh, he took the job that he was able to get, which was a job as uh, uh, teaching at Alagapa College in Karakudi. Um, and, and much later in his life, he described those eight years as kind of a, a pause in his career. Um, the way his career got unstuck in 1958 was that he got a fellowship from the University of Madras and joined Aladi's theoretical physics group. Um, this was exactly, I believe, the same year that Baal joined Aladi's group, 1958. Um, Baal was, at that time, a normal age student. I don't want to try to say what his age was. We could figure it out by knowing what his birthday is. But, um, he was a normal student going straight from undergraduate um, to Aladi. My dad had had this eight-year gap. Um, he co-authored one paper with Aladi on the title was Ambigenous Stochastic Processes, um, trying to relate the then young Feynman diagram methods to the stochastic process calculations that Aladi was well known for. Um, he, my dad, wrote the complete draft of a thesis, but then in 1960, he won a Commonwealth scholarship to Cambridge um, on the strength of Aladi's letter of reference to Longett Higgins in Cambridge. So my dad went to Cambridge in 1960 and completed his, a PhD there, technically in theoretical chemistry. Um, in reality, my dad went from theoretical physics to computer science. There was no such thing as computer science in 1960 but he was developing early numerical methods to solve the Schrodinger equation um, on a computer the size of, probably bigger than this auditorium. Um, 
and his PhD supervisor in Cambridge was Frank Boyce. So um, my dad, though, his official PhD supervisor was Frank Boyce, and Frank Boyce did supervise his PhD work for three years in Cambridge, but my dad always felt he had two PhD supervisors, um, Aladi and Frank Boyce. Um, late, in my, late in the last, I don't remember exactly when, but in the last decade of my dad's life, some, at some point, he realized he didn't have a picture of Aladi, so he contacted Aladi's son in Florida, got a picture of Aladi, and for more than 10 years, um, he, my dad made this um, and framed this, and this was hanging on the wall in my father's room for more than the last 10 years of his life. That's Aladi on the left and Frank Boyce on the right, um, the way my dad chose to remember both of them. Um, so just for fun, I thought I'd show some other pictures too from that era. This is my father in 1950, when he graduated um, from Loyola College. Um, this, I believe, it's obviously a staged a portrait. Um, this photograph, I believe, is 1959. This should be how Baal remembers my father. Um, uh, and this is, if I have the year right, this is my father at the time he was working with Aladi. Um, this is my father graduating from Cambridge in 63. Um, and now I have a set of pictures that I, in, in preparing this talk, I went through my father's things, all of which I have. Um, and I looked for photographs from this era. I, I knew because he had lamented this many times. He had no picture of him with Aladi. So, but, but there's this, I've got four pictures to show you. And this one, I'm not sure I know what this is actually, who these are. I believe these are professors at Alagapa College in Karakudi, in which case there's no connection to Aladi. But I am not sure. So if anyone, including Baal, recognizes anyone here, please tell me afterwards. Uh, my father is right there, but I don't think I know who anyone else is. And then my dad, in his collection of photographs from the 1950s, had three pictures from Aladi's group. And um, this is the first. And I don't know, what these may be standard pictures that are from a book or something. I don't know. I certainly know my father never did not take these photographs. There's no way he had a camera. Um, but these are the three pictures that I found. That's, that's Aladi. I don't know who the other two folks are. This is a meeting of Aladi's group from the late 50s, um, as is this. There's Aladi in action, again, from the late 50s. And for those of you who are at the IMSC, if these pictures are not familiar to you, I'd be happy to give you copies of them. What's that? They're all, they're all up there. Yeah, okay, so my father kept these photographs. I don't know where he got them from, but he didn't actually have a photograph with him at Aladi. Um, uh, this was the one he hung on his wall. So um, what happened to that thesis? Why did he not get a degree with Aladi? Um, it's because when the Commonwealth Scholarship came through, Aldi said, stop working on the thesis. You don't need a thesis from University of Madras. You're going to Cambridge. You'll get a thesis there. I need you to work on my book for me. Um, this, this is uh, what became Aldi's book published in 1962. And my dad's job was to develop and design all of the pictures, all of the diagrams. There are about 75 diagrams in that book. All of them were first um, developed in pencil, back and forth between my father and Aladi, and then my dad drew them in India ink. And then when my dad took the ship to Cambridge in 1960, he took these drawings with him and hand-delivered them to Aladi's publisher in London. Um, so that's what he did instead of finishing a thesis, instead of finishing a degree. Um, in Cambridge, my father met my mother, who was then a student at Munich. While both were on vacation in London over Christmas of 1962, um, my dad did, then did a postdoc in Munich, and in 1966 became a professor. He was appointed as a tenured professor in 1966 um, in, at York University in Toronto, and that's where I grew up. Um, these are my parents. This is around the time I was in high school. Um, I'm not sure of the exact year. Um, this is my dad in 2014. Um, just to remind you that the climate in Toronto is a little different than the climate in Chennai. Um, this is my dad in 2014 in front of the apartment where he lived for more than 40 years and where I grew up. Uh, also around 2014, this was my favorite, one of my favorite photographs. Um, this is another, uh, this is 2019. Um, and then the last picture I'll show is this one. 
because there's three generations in this picture, and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the next generation. Um, so this picture was taken in February of 2020. We didn't know it, but it was four months before my dad passed away. Um, and it was also one month before the pandemic started, which all of you uh, will remember. Um, so my dad, that's me. Um, these are my two sons, two of my dad's four grandchildren. Let me speak first about the other two. Um, so my brother has two kids also. Um, uh, one of my brother's, my, my brother's older um, a, a kid, who's a, a, my brother's son, he graduated from MIT um, a couple of years ago with an engineering degree, um, electrical engineering, computer science, and math. Um, um, my brother's daughter is currently a student at MIT, graduating from MIT this year. Um, this is my older son. Um, um, with his grandfather uh, when my, at this point, in this picture, he's 16. Um, he's now a second year student at MIT, um, studying computer science and nuclear engineering. Um, and this is my younger son. In this picture, he was 15. Um, he was just admitted to MIT a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, so my father was very proud of all of his grandchildren um, and he doesn't, no, didn't know it, but it looks like all four will have gone through MIT as undergraduates. Um, Isaac here is the pure mathematician in the, of the bunch. Um, we'll see where he ends up going. Um, all of them use math. All four of his grandchildren use math in everything that they do. Isaac is the one who's interested in studying math. Um, and then this, this is one of my um, relatives here in Chennai. I had dinner with her yesterday. Um, this is my niece, so it's my father's brother's granddaughter. So same generation, the younger generation to me, two generations younger than my father. She um, spent many, many years at Kalakshetra as a dancer. So she is a performer. She's an amazing um, uh, 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 dancer, but she's also a student of dance, the history of, da the history of, of South Indian dance. She is... Um, has as deep an expertise in South Indian dance as um, my dad's four grandchildren do in their mathematical disciplines. And my um, father was just as proud of her. Um, so um, the reason I did this is just to say that for my dad, he always saw Aladi as one of his two doctoral mentors. And that makes me, all of my students, um, among my students, the one who's a professor in India is Rishi Sharma at TIFR. Um, all of my students and my sons, um, all parts of Aladi's tree. Um, and so, um, of course, IMSC is the biggest part of Aladi's tree. Um, all of its faculty, all of its students over 60 years. But um, uh, I feel that through my father, I and my students and my children, um, are also part of Aldi's tree along with IMSC, and that's why it's a privilege for me to help you celebrate the 60th anniversary of the IMSC here today. So um, now on to physics for the rest of the hour. Um, so the title of my talk, the, the title of the physics part of my talk, is Heavy Ion Collisions, What Next? Um, and so the context here is that by what, what have heavy ion collisions done? Before we get to what next, what have they done? Um, they recreate droplets of the matter that fill the microsecond old universe. And what we've learned from these experiments over the past 20 years, um, not 60, um, over the past 20 years, is that they're reproducing the first liquid that ever existed, um, the liquid from which protons and neutrons formed about, a micros about 20 microseconds after the Big Bang. Um, the hottest liquid that's ever existed, the earliest complex form of matter, it's the most liquid liquid that's ever existed. Um, and in a sense, the simplest form of complex matter, simplest in the sense of closest to the fundamental Lagrangian of nature, um, it's the simplest form of complex matter there is, so it, it's a, it behooves us to try to understand it. Um, so th these are the discoveries, for this, it's, this is different ways of saying that the, the central discovery that he of heavy ion collisions um, of the past um, 20 years. All great discoveries pose new challenges, and I'm gonna speak about some recent advances and what next,
But I'm first going to give an extended introduction, about a 20-minute introduction. And um, the way I'm going to do the introduction is that it turns out that in the United States right now, we are in the middle of the long-range planning process for nuclear physics. Um, all of the nuclear physicists in the US community are arguing with each other about what experimental programs should be funded over the coming decade, what the future directions of the field are, what the opportunities are. This is something that the community does roughly every eight years. Uh, the last time was 2015. And it's natural as you're going through this long range planning process to look back at what did you say in 2015? So what did I say in 2015 um, at the time we were um, uh, making a plan for the field for the decade beginning in 2015? So I actually went back and I took slides from 2015. And for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to introduce this subject using slides from 2015. And then we'll see um, um, how, 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 how well were we doing in 2015 by looking ahead. So um, next slide, few slides are vintage 2015. Um, so what is quark gluon plasma? It's the infinite temperature phase of QCD. Um, Asymptotic freedom tells us that in this infinite temperature limit, it's a, it's a weakly coupled plasma of quarks and gluons. Furthermore, um, it was very well known in 2015, well before 2015, from lattice calculations, that um, QCD thermodynamics features a smooth continuous crossover at a temperature of around 150 MeV, which corresponds to 20 microseconds after the Big Bang. And this is the temperature at which the quark gluon plasma that filled the universe earlier than that time fell apart into hadrons. And the symmetry breaking that characterizes the QCD vacuum developed. Um, and what heavy ion collisions are doing is reproducing droplets of QGP at temperatures several times this characteristic temperature, as much as, say, three times this characteristic temperature today. So um, this is a lattice calculation from 2010, which I showed in 2015. Um, and uh, absolutely still, um, uh, the, the calculations have been um, done with other lattice technologies, but the results have stood the test of time. And you see this crossover at which the energy density and the pressure and the entropy density are rising continuously up to a value which is around 0.8 times that of a non-interacting ideal gas of quarks and gluons, the Stefan Boltzmann limit. Um, but one of the lessons of the past decade is that even though its thermodynamics is within 20% of a non-interacting gas, quark gluon plasma is nothing like that. Um, it is, in fact, very different in its dynamics than a gas. This is a lesson that we learned from experiment in hydrodynamics, as I'll say on the next slide. But um, we could have learned it, and post facto learned it, from a large class of gauge theories with holographic duals, um, all of whose plasmas have energy densities and entropy densities at infinite coupling that are 75% of their value at zero coupling. And so the lesson is that looking at thermodynamic quantities like this is not a good way of telling if you have a gaseous, tenuous plasma or a strongly coupled liquid. Um, and in fact, what we have is a strongly coupled liquid. Um, this was learned from hydrodynamic analyses of RIC data on how asymmetric, how, so how do you make an asymmetric blob of quark gluon plasma? Well, when you build a collider and collide nuclei, they don't hit head on. They, in general, will hit with some impact parameter. So the blobs of quark gluon plasma you make have an, an, an asymmetric shape. Um, and by studying how those asymmetric blobs explode, um, uh, we learned that quark gluon plasma is a strongly coupled liquid with 8 over s, this is shear viscosity over entropy density, which is the dimension, dimensionless, excuse me, characterization of how much dissipation occurs as a liquid flows, with this dimensionless characterization of dissipation being much smaller than that of all other known liquids except one. And I'll tell you what the one exception is um, on the next slide. Um, so what we learned is that quarks and gluons in this stuff, they um, can diffuse around without being confined into hadrons. So quarks and gluons are not confined, but they're absolutely not free. Um, its energy density and coupling are so large that they're always bumping into each other. It's a very strongly coupled fluid. It's very far from non-interacting. The mean free paths are, are so short as to be hard to define, and the relaxation times are around one over the temperature. 
So the, the discovery of the past 20 years is that quarks and gluons and QGP are not confined. Yes, that's as predicted in the 80s, uh, even in the mid 70s, um, but they're also far from free. Um, and it's the discovery that this stuff is a strongly coupled liquid that has made QGP more interesting than previously anticipated and more interesting to a broad scientific community. So what's the other fluid with an 8 over S that's almost as small? It's uh, 20 orders of magnitude colder in temperature. It's a nano Kelvin fluid. It's an ultra cold uh, cloud of trapped fermionic atoms where the experimentalists in atomic physics can dial the interaction to make the, um, um, the coupling length infinite, uh, the scattering length infinite. So it's, it's as strongly coupled as it can possibly be. Um, and they are able to literally take photographs of the explosion of a blob of atoms. There's the blob. Um, they turn off the trapping potential and watch the blob explode, and you can see that it explodes left to right much more than it explodes top to bottom, and that's what you would expect from hydrodynamic fluid. If this was a gas, when you turn the walls, when you turn the trap off, all the atoms would just go in random directions and it would quickly circularize. Um, by comparing data like this to hydrodynamic calculations, they extracted 8 over S's that were less than 0.4. Um, this is a reference to that work. Okay, so in heavy ion collisions now, you get pictures like this. This is not the same picture as, this is a picture in position space. This is a picture in momentum space. Um, a detector, this is an L, these are LHC events, but a, a detector at Rick or the LHC measures the momentum of particles. Um, but what you can see is that in this collision, there's a lot more momentum flowing in these two directions than there is flowing in these two directions. This is a very asymmetric explosion. Um, th this one looks, you know, quite blobby. It's far from circularly symmetric. This one. You can, you can talk yourself into it being hexagonal. This one happens to be circular. Um, and so, well, we're going to use hydrodynamics, or people used hydrodynamics to analyze those data. Um, but before we go there, um, is it possible, possibly legit, to use hydrodynamics in heavy ion collisions, um, given that everything happens so quickly? And because the agreement between data and hydrodynamics can be spoiled either if there's a lot of dissipation, which is to say if 8 over S is too large, or if it takes too long for the droplet to equilibrate. So when you see agreement with hydrodynamics, um, there's a long-standing estimate going back to the year 2001 that a hydrodynamic description must already be valid only one Fermi after the collision, and that's the time it takes light to cross a proton. So for um, 15 years, this 10 years, this was seen as um, a problem. How on earth can this stuff um, equilibrate or become a hydrodynamic fluid within one Fermi over C? Um, as of 2015, the best answer that we had to this question came from holography, not from perturbative QCD. So the best answer that we had as of 2015 was to look at holographic calculations of collisions in a theory that could be analyzed using ADS-CFT, um, gauge gravity duality. So this is, uh, this is um, time and beam direction. This is a heavy ion, quote unquote. It's a sheet of a blob of energy density coming in on one light cone, colliding with another one coming in on the other, and this is the quark gluon plasma um, of N equals four super I Mills theory. And um, these calculations, which were initiated in 2010, and really um, this picture was solidified by 2013, um, showed that um, it was natural at strong coupling to get hydrodynamization times um, even of, a, say, a third of a Fermi. So um, we'll come back to this in a minute. Um, but bolstered by post facto intuition that the fluid is strongly coupled and that strong coupling equilibration happens fast. Um, as of 2015, this was the bottom line slide. Um, um, so using relativistic viscous hydrodynamics calculations to describe an expanding QGP produced in an initially lumpy heavy ion collision. To describe the data, you have to take seriously that nuclei are made of protons and neutrons. They're not featureless blobs. They have nucleons in them. 
and they are lumpy. Um, and uh, using um, um, quite sophisticated hydrodynamic calculations, as of 2015, um, I was in colloquia back then able to say things like at RIC, the 8 over S was between 1 and 2 times 1 over 4 pi. At the LHC, it was between 1 and 3 times 1 over 4 pi. Why were we normalizing it in units of 1 over 4 pi? Because in any of those holographic gauge theories, 8 over S is 1 times 1 over 4 pi. Um, uh, to, to, to give you a sense of scale for terrestrial gases like air, 8 over S is about 10 to the fourth times 1 over 4 pi. For um, water, it's around 100 times 1 over 4 pi. Um, and for, if I go back, for this uh, fluid, um, it's around 3 times 1 over 4 pi, or 4 times 1 over 4 pi. Um, and uh, quark gluon plasma is between 1 and 2, or 1 and 3. That's where we were in 2015. Um, there's a beautiful analogy between the story that I've told you in this introductory part of this talk, between what we do in heavy ion collision physics and what our friends in cosmology do when looking at the early universe. Um, this is an experimental measurement of the fluctuations of the um, um, cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, and from these data, Fourier transformed, you describe these data remarkably well um, out to Fourier modes of around 1,000, now several thousand. How does this description work? You have to have an understanding of the initial quantum fluctuations. For us, those initial quantum fluctuations, this is, this is an artist's rendition of the initial lumpy blobs that you get by colliding two nuclei before things equilibrate. Um, this lumpiness comes from the nuclear structure. And um, um, so these are the quantum, initial quantum fluctuations in our field. The initial quantum fluctuations over here came from inflation. Um, those initial quantum fluctuations from inflation on the left or from protons and neutrons on the right get processed by hydrodynamics and you get this. Here they get processed by hydrodynamics and you get this. This was data as of 2005. Um, this was the quality of the comparison between data on the first five moments of the Fourier transform of distributions like this. So you describe this by Fourier transforming in, 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 in phi and um, uh, uh, you can describe that data with hydrodynamics and with initial conditions that look like this. Um, so last slide from 2015. Um, what we've learned, another way of saying this to any of you who are condensed matter physicists, um, quark gluon plasma and this Fermi gas and the gauge theory plasma with holographic descriptions are all examples of strongly coupled fluids with no apparent quasi-particles. Um, in quark gluon plasma, the 8 over s as small as it is, there can be no self-consistent description in terms of quasi-particles because for the quasi-particle description to be self-consistent, the lifetime or the mean free path of the quasi-particles must be much longer than 1 over t. And that lifetime at weak coupling is 5 8 over s times 1 over t. And when 8 over s is smaller than, you know, is, is as small as 0.2, this makes no sense. So, um, what are some other examples of fluids with no quasi-particle description? Well, the strange metal phase of high-temperature superconductivity is a famous example. Spin liquids, another famous example. Matter at quantum critical points, another famous example. So um, among the grand challenges of the frontiers of condensed matter physics today, there are many examples of strongly correlated electron fluids. Um, Quark-gluon plasma is a strongly correlated quark and gluon fluid. Um, so in all of these cases, after you discover such a form of matter, what do you do next? Well, you probe it and you dope it. And that's where I'm going in the second half of the talk. But first, um, this device I used of, 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 of giving you the introduction from 2015, do I have to change anything? Um, the, the, the really nice thing is that, no, I don't have to change anything. I have to add a couple of points, but I don't have to change anything. So we. By looking back at where we were in 2015, now with today's eyes, I think we can say that our picture is reasonably solid. Um, there have been many improvements, but the picture was solid. 
So to give you um, two examples of how things have gotten better, um, we now today in 2022 have a much more complete understanding of how hydrodynamization happens in kinetic theory at weak coupling. A weakly coupled picture when you applied an intermediate coupling, now we know, we didn't know in 2015, but now we know, uh, g gives you a hydrodynamic fluid within one Fermi over C. This is an enormous body of work by many, many people in the past seven years. Um, also, back in 2015, we had a qualitative and intuitive understanding of how equilibration can happen so quickly at strong coupling from ADS-CFT. Now, I think, um, since 2020, um, we have a qualitative and intuitive understanding in kinetic theory also in the language of adiabatic hydrodynamization developed by these authors. Um, I don't have time to um, explain this, but for those of you planning a seminar series, I would invite some of these authors to tell you about how um, the, in kinetic theory, one can understand the way that hydrodynamics emerges um, using an analog to the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics. And then probably the biggest update since in 20, as of now, is um, we no longer have to um, make statements like this. Um, many, many experimentalists making precise measurements and many theorists working together have now um, uh, uh, developed quite sophisticated Bayesian determinations of the parameters that describe the shape of the fluid initially and the key properties of QGP and their temperature dependence. I, I'm not gonna go through this because this is not a technical seminar and this is also not my work, but um, from one such uh, uh, calculation by these authors, this is the kind of thing that you get. This is 19 different parameters. Eight over S is right there. This is the post facto probability distribution for eight over S from a Bayesian calculation in which there were 19 free parameters um, uh, constrained by thousands of data points. Um, and you can see some of these parameters are well constrained, some of them are, are less well constrained. You, from where you sit in the back of the room, you can't read what these parameters are, which is fine because I'm not planning to go through this in detail. I will say this one to me is amusing. This is a parameter in their modeling where zero means the initial state is weakly coupled and one means the initial state is ADS-CFT or ADS-CFT-like, and um, their Bayesian determination favors a strongly coupled initial state, which I find quite pleasing. We'll see whether this stands the test of time. This is state of the art. Um, you can also get correlations between all of these different parameters. If one goes up, is that correlated with how others behave? Um, so this is the full correlation matrix um, that you get from a Bayesian study. And to give you a sense of how things have progressed since 20, 15, if in 2015, this group of jokers um, had proposed this workshop to the Institute for Nuclear Theory, they would have been laughed out of town. This is a workshop that starts uh, in two weeks. It's, um, I'm not one of the proposers. Um, these are the folks who proposed it. These folks are running an entire workshop um, based on the idea that by colliding heavy nuclei at the LHC and analyzing the data with the precision of the techniques I've tried to give you a impressionistic view of, we'll be able to learn new facts about nuclear structure. They, they believe that you'll be able to study the shape of nuclei by the shape of the explosions that you get from colliding nuclei with such precision that they think that they'll be able to um, add to what's known about nuclear structure so this, this, this is the title, Intersection of Nuclear Structure and High-Energy Nuclear Collisions. Um, in 2015, the reaction of the program committee at the INT would have been, pah! But uh, it got approved, and it's starting in two weeks. Um, OK, so here ends my introduction, and then my update to the introduction. Um, so what next? Um, there, there are two kinds of what next questions for the coming decade. Um, a question that one often asks after the discovery of a new form of mat complex matter is what's its phase diagram? Um, uh, for high temperature superconductors, for example, you look at the phase diagram as a function of temperature and doping. For us, we have, well, we have temperature, but we also have doping. Doping for us means excess of quarks over antiquarks rather than 
holes over electrons. But it's doping. Um, the second what next question um, is one that we are privileged to have a chance to address. I think we have a better chance than our condensed matter physics friends on this second question, which is how does this strongly coupled liquid emerge from an asymptotic for gauge theory? Because the quark gluon plasma is in a sense so close to the fundamental laws of nature, can we see how the fundamental laws of nature um, uh, have hidden within them this strongly correlated form of matter? Um, but let's start with the first one, the phase diagram. So this is a cartoon of the phase diagram of high temperature superconductivity. Um, the strange metal phase is the analog of the quark gluon plasma. There is a superconducting phase here. These two phases here are the analog of, um, of a hadron gas. Um, I could explain later why there are two phases here instead of one. Um, this Fermi liquid phase has no analog in the QCD phase diagram, but here is the cartoon of the QCD phase diagram. Here's the quark gluon plasma, it's the analog of the strange metal phase. Here's the hadron gas, it's the analog of the pseudo gas phase. And here's the color superconducting phase that um, as Srihari kindly reminded me, um, I wrote lots of papers about um, um, uh, at a certain point, but we won't talk about today. Um, heavy ion collisions can explore this entire range, region of the phase diagram here. Um, heavy ion collisions at the LHC and at the top energies of RIC explore this vertical axis. So the LHC makes blobs of quark gluon plasma that expand and cool just like the early universe did at very low doping. Um, baryon doping, um, we parameterize with a chemical potential. Um, so the, the quantitative plot, the, the numbers here are baryon chemical potential. Um, the way that you dope the QGP is you do collisions at lower energies. As you go to collisions at lower, this is sort of reversing history. As you do collisions at lower and lower energies, you dump more and more of the initial baryon number from the two colliding nuclei into the QGP. You dope the plasma more and more. And um, we, had, we believe that in heavy ion collisions down to a collision energies of seven, top rick energy is 200. We can get out to about here on this phase diagram. And this is the regime where there might be a critical point where this crossover turns into a first order phase transition. Um, the search for this critical point is something that, um, again, as Srihari mentioned, um, I've been thinking about uh, for quite some time. Um, and so the question is, how does the quark gluon plasma change as you dope it? Can, is, as you dope it, um, this is a place where I could not show you slides from 2015. They would be antiquated. Um, there's been very substantial recent progress Slides from 2015 are, are almost completely superseded. Um, there's been enormous progress on theory and modeling by many people, including by the, the, the best collaboration. Um, I was a member of this collaboration. One of our accomplishments was to choose a good acronym. This is the Beam Energy Scan Theory Collaboration. Um, and uh, we, we did a lot of work um, and in, two, in 2021 wrote a, a 100 page compendium describing um, this enormous progress in theory and modeling by, um, by a large group of people. Um, I will say um, BES here is beam energy scan. The, the um, RIC accelerator has now completed data taking at all these energies down to 7.7. Um, the, the data taking was completed in 2021. We theorists have not seen any results yet because the experimentalists are still analyzing the data and they haven't showed us anything yet we should be seeing results in 2023. Um, uh, just to give you a sense, um, the, the, this is the number of events taken at all those different energies, and you see the red bars are orders of magnitude higher than the gray bars. The data I'm about to show you comes from the gray bars. Um, this program was begun with a phase one, which happened in the mid-2010s, between 2011 and 2014. The data from this early exploratory phase was sufficiently interesting to motivate um, doing this high statistics exploration that we are now waiting to see the data from. So this is an example of data from the early exploratory phase um, showing a certain observable um, which uh, is, is um, quantifies the non-Gaussianity of the fluctuations in the number of um, protons in a given byte of the, of the collision. 
And what you see is that as, so this is very high energy, so this is undoped plasma. As you turn and go down in energy, you're doping the plasma. As you dope the plasma, this observable is going below one. Now what's one? This is normalized that one equals boring. Okay, one is Poisson statistics. So one is no, um, is, it, one, is, it, one is not, is, is boring. So it's going below one, and then it might be going above one. And then it goes um, below one again at even lower energies. Now why is that interesting? That's interesting because if you look at the phase diagram and you put a critical point there, um, you can use the universe, universal physics that we know occurs near a critical point to say that in a red region like this, that observable I showed you should be negative, and in the blue regions shown here, it should be positive. And as you lower the collision energy of the heavy ion collisions, as you go lower and lower and lower and lower and lower energies, you should see first it going, this observable should go negative, and then it should go positive. Um, this is a cartoon that's now about a decade old, showing that it's this observable, this is boring, it first goes negative, then it goes positive, it has a peak, and then it comes back down. That would be the discovery of a critical point in the QCD phase diagram. Um, it goes down, but we don't yet know if it goes up. And that's why we're waiting with great interest for the high statistics data that will come soon. Um, but what have theorists been up to as we wait for the data, this is almost a pencil sketch, okay? Um, this is not a quantitative prediction. We wanna have quantitative predictions to compare to the data that we're gonna see in about a year. That means we need to model the dynamics of heavy ion collisions in this regime, um, and that requires four steps here. I'm gonna skip the first step. Um, I'm gonna speak a little bit about the second and a little more about the third and fourth. Um, the second step is you need an equation of state for doped quark gluon plasma. Um, the equation of state from um, many is known from the work of many people, including people in this room, at chemical potential equals zero. Um, uh, in fact, um, lattice calculations are now constraining the equation of state at non-zero but not so large chemical potentials. We, um, in the best collaboration, developed a model equation of state that respects everything we know reliably from lattice QCD and has a critical point in it. Um, uh, this equation of state, which is being improved today, can then be used as further input, as input to the steps three and four to yield predictions for data. So step three is we need to calculate hydrodynamics of a fluid with critical fluctuations. And this is a non-trivial requirement um, because these critical fluctuations um, um, which develop in those collisions that pass near a critical point cannot be in equilibrium. So many of you in this room are interested in out of equilibrium physics in various contexts. This is a situation where the reason the physics goes out of equilibrium is that as the, as the blob of stuff cools past the critical point, um, in, if it were in equilibrium, there's a correlation length that would become infinite. But because you have only a short time and because of critical slowing down, um, there's no way that the actual critical fluctuations can get as big as they would in equilibrium. So of necessity, the physics is out of equilibrium, and so you need a self-consistent treatment of hydrodynamics of an expanding relativistic fluid and out of equilibrium critical fluctuations. Um, there are two formalisms that were developed within the best collaboration. We're using one that was developed by Stefanov and Yin. Um, and we have done the first implementations of this formalism, and I want, the various authors are here, I want to highlight uh, Manisha Pradeep. Um, uh, Manisha is not my student. Um, she's Misha Stefanov's student, but I've been working with her for about two years now. She's amazing. Um, and, and she's been the key driver of the most recent of these calculations. Uh, she's just, um, I think she's known to some people in the room. Um, um, uh, she was, um, <coughs> before she went to Chicago, she spent some time at TIFR during her undergrad days. Um, she was at, who can tell me where she was an undergrad? Niser. Yeah, she was an undergrad at Niser. Um, 
Uh, she's just finishing her PhD this semester, and she's just accepted a postdoc at the University of Maryland with Paolo Badaki, Tom Cohen, um, and company. Um, and so um, just to, this is from a, a slide that Manisha made. Um, just to give you a sense of what you get from these calculations for this is part three out of four. Um, in equilibrium, this is a measure of the fluctuations at a given Q. Um, in equilibrium, they diverge. In reality, they don't. And you can look at the critical slowing down by seeing that the lower Q modes are more suppressed um, relative to equilibrium than the higher Q modes. If you go to higher wavelength, you get less suppression relative to the equilibrium result. This is a classic way of seeing the effects of critical slowing down um, in this formalism. OK, what's step four? Uh, experimentalists can't measure this. Experimentalists measure protons. So um, we need to freeze those critical fluctuations out. We need to freeze that calculation out so as to faithfully turn the critical fluctuations into fluctuations of protons, of the observed proton multiplicities. And this is the second half of that paper that Manisha and her colleagues, including me, wrote in 2022. Um, you can see in the results in that paper, you can see effects of conservation, which I'll skip. Um, you can, and we were able to calculate observable quantities like the very, the, the, this is the variance, this, these are the fluctuations in the number of protein, proteins, protons. This is the variance um, normalized by the mean. Um, and you can see that the, it's not as big as in equilibrium. Um, sorry, that's the, that's, that's the uh, you, you can see that the equilibrium results are very sensitive to the freeze out temperature, the non-equilibrium non results are much less so. You see the suppression relative to equilibrium by comparing the numbers on the vertical axis here with the numbers on the vertical axis here. Um, so uh, we're almost there. Um, what we need now, in order to make predictions for this observable, which I showed you here, th this is C4, which is the fourth moment of those fluctuations. And what, I'm sh what I've showed you here is the second moment of those fluctuations. And um, uh, again, driven by Manisha, Jamie Carthine has now joined us. She's a postdoc at MIT. Um, we are uh, in the process of calculating the skewness and kurtosis of the observed proton multiplicities. This is what the experimentalists are in the process of measuring. So um, the bottom line today is that the phase diagram mapping the theory and modeling tools are vastly better than in 2015. Um, they're being completed, and the data's coming soon. Um, so looking ahead to the coming decade, what we're looking ahead to is the comparison between precise data with um, 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 so relatively much more sophisticated um, theoretical modeling than was available in 2015. Um, so in the last... Um, quarter of the talk, I'm going to look at um, this other what next question, which is how does the quark gluon plasma, which turns out to be the strongly coupled liquid, how does that emerge from an asymptotically free gauge theory? After all, Gross, Wilczek, and Pollitzer don't have to give their prize back. Um, so there are actually three different variants of this question. Um, this question in red. Um, can be interpreted three ways, depending on how you interpret the English language word emerge. Okay, the one that's to me the most interesting is the first one here, where the word emerge, you, you think of this in the language of the renormalization group. Um, you think of emerge as a function of resolution scale. So given what we know about the microscopic structure of the liquid, which is that it, it, it has to involve asymptotically free quarks and gluons, how is it that if you course in your scale, so if you, run, if you run the RG downwards, how is it that you can get a hydrodynamic fluid of the kind that we've discovered? Um, this is the version of the question that I'm going to focus on in the last part of the talk. But just to say, there are two other forms of this question, because emerge can mean as a function of time also. And I've already spoken about this. I'll say nothing more about it. But um, I think there, in the coming decade, there will be a lot further development in our understanding of how quark gluon plasma, how the strongly coupled fluid, forms as a function of time also. Um, and then the third form of the question is emerge as a function of droplet size. Surely in E plus E minus collisions, you don't make quark gluon plasma. Um, 
what about proton-proton collisions or helium-helium collisions or copper-copper collisions or um, um, uh, iron-iron collisions? Or, you know, we know that for the large nuclei, you make quark gluon plasma. What about as a function of droplet size? Um, this is a very interesting question. There have been a lot of recent developments, and I think both of these questions are central to the coming decade. I can't speak about them today. I had a slide here on the, um, one of them, but I don't have time. So we want to probe the quark gluon plasma at short distance scales. How do we do that? Um, first of all, how short distance scales do we need to go to? Um, we need, if we want to see the inner workings of QGP, we're, we're going to need to um, probe the QGP on scales that have, uh, with a finer resolution scale than the size of a proton, because we need a resolution scale that's smaller than the length scales where hydrodynamics works, and we've learned that hydrodynamics works on length scales of order the size of a proton. So we need to probe the QGP with a resolution that's substantially smaller than the size of a proton. And the only way we know of um, probing the QGP at short distance scales is to look at events in which you make a blob of QGP and you make a jet also. So if you could take a blob of QGP to the linear accelerator nearest you and shoot an electron beam at it, you could do deep and elastic scattering off QGP. Okay? That would be wonderful. That's impossible. Because this droplet lives for 10 to the minus 20 seconds, 10 to the minus 21 seconds, no time to bring it to Stanford or um, wherever uh, you have an electron accelerator. So you have to look for probes that are produced in the same collision that produces the QGP. And the best that we get is um, looking at jets. So looking at jets as they plow through the quark gluon plasma is our best shot at getting experimental evidence for the presence of point-like scatterers in the QGP, um, but it's not easy, as we'll see. Uh, but looking at, you, looking at jets in heavy ion collisions is the closest that we'll ever come to doing a scattering experiment off a droplet of Big Bang matter. If you think about it, these nuclear collisions are making droplets of the matter that filled the Big Bang, filled the universe one microsecond after the Big Bang, and now we're trying to probe them by doing a scattering experiment by looking at, if I look at the partons inside a jet, how do they scatter off of quasi-particles in the quark gluon plasma? Um, that sounds great, but it's actually a lot harder than it sounds. Um, one of the reasons it's harder than it sounds is that Jets don't um, do lots, they do lots of things. They don't only do what I just said. Um, as a jet plows through the QGP, it leaves energy behind. It, it, it's losing energy, that means it's creating a wake. That wake is a perturbation of the hydrodynamic fluid. Um, this is very interesting in its own right, um, and, um, but if what you're interested in is the short distance structure, you have to figure out how to avoid being um, um, how, to, how to look at observables that are not um, telling you principally about the hydrodynamic response of the medium. Um, so we need high statistics data. This is why in the United States, an entirely new detector has been built at RIC. This S Phoenix detector is the first detector designed to be a jet detector at RIC. Um, it starts taking data um, in April, so three months from now. Um, um, and the LHC is now running with much higher statistics than before. This is called LHC Run 3, and in four years, it'll be running at even higher statistics, LHC Run 4. So the high statistics data that will come from S Phoenix at RIC and the LHC, um, these high statistics are needed because events in which a parton in a jet scatters at 45 degrees are quite rare. So we need high statistics. Um, so what can we theorists do today? Um, well, we can try to answer questions like, how do we separate observable effects due to the wake, the hydrodynamic response in the fluid, from observable effects due to scattering off of quasi-particles? And it's, this is, in fact, where I'm going to end. I'm not quite there yet. Um, so I want to give you a sense of what theorists are doing today. Um, you could say since 2015, but um, this is really all, all these examples are, are, are more recent than that. Um, 
So theorists are taking key steps toward realizing this vision of using jets as probes. And I want to say a few words about four examples here. Looking at the time, I may be brief on some of them. All four of these examples, um, I will make my remarks in ways that rely upon a particular model for jets in quark-gluon plasma. This model is called the hybrid model. Um, um, and I'm going to show you what the model is on the next, next slide. B um, but um, uh, the, the things that I will say are all general. Um, but the calculations that I will show are done in this model. Um, models um, are useful at times. Um, and um, one of the things that makes models useful is that in a, there are things you can do in a model that you can't do in data. In data, when you look at data on jets in heavy ion collisions, all these effects are there. They're all mixed together. In a model, you can turn off effects one by one, and hence you can, you can separate out effects by turning some things off, other uh, things on, in ways that you can never do in data. Um, so what's the model we're going to use? It's a hybrid model because it, it, is a, it is a hybrid of perturbative QCD and ADS-CFT. Um, we take a perturbative shower. So this is the blob of QGP made in heavy ion collision. Here is um, two partons colliding, making a back-to-back -back pair of jets. Um, this is a jet described by Pythia. So we take, we take the high Q squared parton shower from perturbative QCD as incarnated in Pythia, and we stick it into this blob of soup. And we then use a holographic calculation of how energetic partons lose energy in strongly coupled soup. Um, this is uh, an analytic expression for how the rate of energy loss, the EDX, um, uh, for a high energy parton in soup. Um, it has one free parameter in it, which we have to fit to data. And so each of these partons in this shower, these back arrows are trying to give you the visual impression that they're losing energy. They're being slowed down. And how much energy they lose is governed by this equation in this model, which and this equation has one free parameter. Now, that lost energy, um, energy is not, energy is conserved. It can't be lost. It goes into ripples in the plasma. And uh, since 2016, we've had a very crude way, which is encoded here, of describing the observable consequences of the ripples in the plasma. So in this model, we have energy loss, and then we have the fluid response, but done very crudely. Um, and so what now can we do with this model? So um, first thing, um, maybe I will uh, have to skip this one. Um, for any of you who are phenomenologists, um, um, it's critically important to separate observable effects of the actual modification of jets. You shoot this jet through the plasma, it changes. That's what we're interested in from selection bias. Um, and uh, this is actually incredibly important. It's, it's what you have to think about first. Um, but I think given the breadth of the audience and the shortness of time, I'm going to skip those results. Um, the, Next thing that I'll say um, one word about is, can the quark-gluon plasma even see partons inside a jet? You have this branching, I've got this jet, it's this branching shower going through the soup. Maybe the soup just responds to it as if it was a single object. It maybe, can it really see the structure inside the jet? This is something we can answer in the model. Um, and it, we answered it in these papers in 2017 and 2019. Um, so can the QGP see partons within a jet, or does, it, does the jet lose energy coherently? Um, I, I won't walk you through the, way we, the calculation we did in 2017 and 2019, but I'll show you. This is a 2022 conference talk from an experimentalist from Elise. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I, because of time, the black are data points. Red is um, our model with the ability to resolve the individual, the inside structure of jets. And um, purple here is our model with um, a jet losing energy coherently. And what you see is that the data 
beautifully favor um, incoherent energy loss, which is to say each of these particles inside a jet shower lose energy independently. This is really important because um, if a jet is a single coherent blob, then we'll never be able to use it to resolve the fine microscopic structure of QGP. So this is a really important necessary condition. Um, a third of four, um, um, what about those jet wakes? I've already told you that um, the, the lost energy becomes a wake. That wake becomes a, what, what, ha what happens to the, that wake at the end? When experimentalists look at the data, they don't see ripples, they see pions. Um, the wake becomes a spray of soft pions at relatively large angles relative to the jet. Um, and to use jets as probes, we have to be able to either calculate or remove the, the observable effects of that wake. Um, this requires, um, the, 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 these, all these calculations require samples of around 100,000 jets to make predictions for observables. Um, it's computationally uh, inaccessible to do a full nonlinear hydrodynamic calculation for the response of the fluid to, the, to every parton in the jet for 100,000 jets. So um, what we're developing is a linearized hydrodynamic treatment, which it turns out will suffice, and which um, speeds up calculations of the wake by about 10,000 and of its hydronization by about a factor of 100. So this is a promise of progress to come in the coming decade for sure, I hope in the coming uh, six months. Okay, um, but so all of these things are necessary conditions. You have to disentangle jet modification from selection bias. You have to show that the QGB can resolve structure inside a jet. You have to be able to understand the wake. And then you can select those jet substrate. You can ask, how do we select those observables that are sensitive to the scattering of jet partons um, and are not sensitive to, the, to, the, to, the, all, to that you know, schmush of particles coming from the wake? Um, and um, so now we need to modify our model um, because we now need to add hard scattering into the hybrid model. And um, I am um, going to skip the first two slides showing the, the giving you a sense of the perturbative QCD calculation. But the idea here, so this was a slide from before. So this is jet parton loses energy and it's making ripples. Now, um, for every little dt here, so he, dt, 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 and then here there's two partons, and here there's three partons. For every dt, we now ask, what's the probability of a hard scattering event off a quark, gluon, of a quark or a gluon in the plasma? And um, if a hard scattering occurs, so in this cartoon, there were two hard scatterings that occurred in this red box and in this red box they change the structure of the jet. So this is obviously a cartoon, but the idea is this jet hadronized as a jet without too much substructure. The hard scattering of the quarks in the jet turned it into a jet with three subjets. So that's what we need to look for. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes more, but I'm close. So. Um, on the next slides, there will be always four curves, red, blue, green, black. Um, red is all the physics. So includes hard elastic scatterings and it includes the wake. Blue is, well, turn off the hard scatterings. Green is turn off the wake but keep the hard scatterings and black is turn off both. So this is something you can only do in a model. Um, so. And what are the observables here? This is the shape of a jet in angle, and this is the shape of a jet in momentum, otherwise known as the fragmentation function. And what you see here is that these observables are very good at looking at the wake. Red and blue are pretty similar. That means the effects of hard scattering are pretty small. Red and green are very different. That means there's a big effect of the wake. So these are examples. The wake is producing particles at large angles that are very soft. The, these observables um, are terrible ways of looking for the microscopic structure of QGP. 
Um, because the microscopic structure of QGP turns blue to red, and that is a very small effect compared to turning uh, green, to, green to blue. Um, uh, again, for those of you who are familiar with uh, jet physics, groomed observables do better. Um, here, red and, remember here, red and blue were together. That was bad. Here, red and green are together. That's good. <coughs> Red and green being together and separated from blue means you can see hard scattering and you're, you're, you're invisible to the wake. So these are groomed observables, which are good ways of looking for the wake. Um, so it's this one, but I'll, I'll go to this one because this is the one that fits the cartoon I um, showed a minute ago. This observable is you take a large fat jet that you found and ask, um, are there small, um, small narrow jets inside the large fat jet? How many subjects are there inside the big jet? And the effect of hard scattering increases the number of subjects. Um, the effect of hard scattering um, spreads the subjects around at larger angles. So this is our best suggestion for an observable that's practically, measur practically measurable at the LHC and at S Phoenix in the coming five years, um, where Red minus green, that's the wake. Um, the wake has a very small effect on this observable. Red minus blue, that's hard scattering. These are good observables for seeing the effects of hard scattering and beginning to access information about the short distance structure of cork gluon plasma. So um, to conclude this uh, talk within a talk, um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll point to this bullet. These subject observables, uh, here we are. These subject observables are especially sensitive to the presence of Molière scatterings, of the hard scatterings, and they're largely unaffected by the wake. So these are the observables we point to. But by the way, the wake is interesting in its own right. The hydrodynamic response of the fluid is um, interesting as an object of study of its own, and we found observables that are sensitive to that and not sensitive to the hard scattering too. So in the next several years, I believe we'll have the golden age of heavy ion collision jet physics. Um, S Phoenix turns on in three months. Uh, LHC run three, the first heavy ion collision of run, uh, run of run three is this November. Um, both of these programs are, will, will, will um, come to fruition over the coming three to four years. Run four will be in the second half of the coming decade. Um, there's also been new observables proposed like in this talk. Um, there have been many theory advances. Um, I've only given you a tiny taste. Um, so all of these theory advances and new observables whet our appetite for the feast to come. Um, I believe over the coming decade, we shall learn about the microscopic structure of QGP and about the dynamics of rippling QGP both. Um, so taking a step backwards, um, this was one of the three ways of looking at how QGP emerges. There will be progress on the other two also. Taking another step backwards, um, I hope I've convinced you that both of these what next questions, what's the phase diagram of QGP and how does this liquid, strongly coupled liquid emerge from an asymptotically free gauge theory are both interesting questions and questions where I believe there will be very substantial progress in the coming decade. So I look forward to coming back for the platinum jubilee of IMSC. This is IMSC at 60, platinum is 70. Um, and when IMSC has its 70th birthday, um, we can discuss the answers to these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krishna, for a very good talk. Um, any questions? Yeah, there's one there. There's one there and there's one in the back. Um, someone needs, okay. Uh. Uh, you talk about QGP phase diagram. Yes. Uh, at a higher density and low temperature, there was another phase, color uh, superconductor phase. Yes. So can you briefly explain what is that and how patterns are behaving inside there? Absolutely. Um, I didn't set the question up. Thank you. Um, so um, at high densities and low temperatures, um, uh, you have a Fermi liquid of quarks. Okay, you have high densities means the Fermi surface, the Fermi momentum is very large. Um, so there's a new large scale in the problem, which is the Fermi momentum. 
So the right way to think about high density QCD is to start with a Fermi surface and then ask what happens. And I don't know if you're a condensed matter physicist, but um, in, in, we know since Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer that if the fermions at that Fermi surface attract each other, you get pairing. Um, for BCS, pairing came from phonon exchange. In QCD, one gluon exchange is attractive. Um, and so there's a robust pairing gap that forms at the Fermi surface. Um, estimates of the gap, this is something that many of us worked on calculating between 1997 and say the mid 2000s, um, uh, range from sort of um, 20, 30 MeV all the way up to let's say 100 plus MeV. Um, so that, and if I, I won't go back to the phase diagram. Um, that high density form of matter is a, a, a phase in which there are Cooper pairs of quarks. So that's the first part of the answer. But then um, you have to ask who pairs with whom. So in BCS theory, it's electrons pairing with electrons. Full stop. Well, um, you have to ask about spin, and the, the pairing is spin singlet. End of story. Um, for quarks, well, quarks have spin. So is the pairing spin singlet? Answer is yes, but that's a question again. But what about their color? Quarks have three colors. What about their flavor? Quarks have, um, at the densities in question, there's up, down, and strange quarks. And so um, a lot of the work um, from that period between the late 90s and the mid 2000s was about the form of the pairing. And I could give an entire talk on it, but um, I would refer you instead to a review paper that I wrote with three co-authors in 2007, and we can also talk afterwards. Such so uh, at the uh, kind of high energies and the, the tiny distances that uh, uh, the QGP exists, uh, uh, how, sh how sure are we that uh, quarks are like point particles and not delocalized over the entire region of, uh, uh, over, the, over the entire blob? So, or uh, maybe a slight rephrasing of this question would be, how sure are we uh, that there are point-like partons that, that you talk towards the uh, end, end of your talk? Ah, okay, so um, I could take your question in one of two, one of two directions. Um, I think I now understand what you meant, but the first thing I thought you were asking about was about diffusion. Um, and the quarks do diffuse. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, and this is something that people in this room have worked on. Again, it's hard for me to see who's sitting where, but um, uh, if you think about charm quarks in the quark gluon plasma, the diffusion constant for a charm quark, which is a nice probe, I didn't talk about it, but it's a nice probe of the QGP also. Um, that diffusion length is something which has experimental consequences and has also been calculated at both weak and strong coupling. And so charm quarks do diffuse in the plasma. We know that in a lot of ways. Um, if you go to the LHC, uh, the he heavy ion collisions in the LHC make, a typical heavy ion collision in the LHC makes about 30,000 pions. Um, it makes about, there's about 30 charm quarks and 30 anti-charm quarks in that soup that becomes 30,000 pions. And um, um, we know that those charm and anti-charm quarks diffuse because the, if you look at the number distribution of um, the J psi particles that come from a charm meeting and anti-charm, they're very well described by just assuming that um, the charm and anti-charm are diffusing freely within the plasma and, and sometimes they find each other and make a J psi at the end. So these quarks certainly diffuse. So when you said spread through the plasma, if you meant diffusion, they do that, they diffuse. But um, I think they're still point-like as far as we know, not from experiment, but from theory because um, how would I address whether they're point like? I would do deep and elastic scattering off the QGP and I would look for partons in the QGP. Look, Frank Wilczek was my advisor. I believe QCD is asymptotically free. So I believe, um, based on what we know from a whole, you know, 50 years of experimentation um, since 1973, this is the 50th anniversary of asymptotic freedom, um, that if you could do DIS off QGP, you would discover quarks in the QGP just as you did inside of a proton. But nobody can actually do that, and physics is an experimental discipline. So I would say that as of today, we have no experimental evidence for point-like partons in the QGP 
unless you include the charm quarks, where I think you can get closer to saying we, we do. I see. But this is what I think we're trying to get in the coming decade. Uh, there was one question there, I thought. No? No, if not Sayantan, go for it. Sayantan? And then for those of you who um, have questions but haven't raised your hand, um, um, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm around for, in fact, I'm in Chennai until um, um, Saturday night, and I'll certainly be um, here for much of the celebration of Bal's birthday. Uh, let me take this moment before you ask your question to wish you a happy birthday. Um, as I told uh, Bal uh, uh, privately outside, my father knew him in 1958, um, but I, I don't, I've never worked with Baal. I don't know him the way all of you do. So I, I don't think I should be the one here to be fetting Baal. So I'm happy that instead I was celebrating the Institute that already founded in, in 60 years ago. But I can certainly wish you a happy birthday. Uh, Sign up. There were these uh, discussions about uh, in the quark gluon plasma at high temperature, there can be monopoles which also scatter the jets. So what uh -huh. is your take on it and what is the di direction in which that I, is? Well, I should ask you what your take on that is. Um, 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 I would love to be able to address that question with data, is what I would say. Um, and um, when we start seeing observables of the type that I showed you measured with precision, um, if we can have a debate between are we scattering off of point like quarks or off of, mon off of monopole configurations in the QGP, wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, then we'll have to figure out how to go, how to do better and, and resolve the question. But I, I, nothing that I have, I, I, what I will say is that the specific model predictions that led to the curves I showed assumed point like quarks, and point like quarks and gluons. But um, if you, do a calculation of those observables, assuming effects of monopoles in the plasma. I don't know what you'll find, um, and it, it, how, how different it will be, I don't know. So um, uh, uh, let's, let's see where we end up. Yeah, before we take the online question, any other questions here? Uh, there's an online question? Yes. Any questions here? Yeah, go for it. So when you show that impact parameter diagram, so you have this peripheral going outside. So in the experiment, how do you like uh, pick those those points only? Like ah, only okay. Those that so those. Um, um, I will tell a funny story, and I will absolutely give you no clue as to which theorist I'm describing. Um, in in right around like 1999. Um, 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 I heard a, a well-known theorist, that's all I will say, um, a, a, in a, in a you know, coffee time conversation at a workshop, and this was a, a theorist um, from the QCD community um, saying, oh, um, there, there, there's no way that Rick will be able to do all this stuff that people are saying because there's no way that you'll be able to aim the ions to make them collide head on. How could you possibly aim them well enough to collide head on? Um, so it's not about aiming them, it's about selection after the fact. Okay, you have a beam from the left and a beam from the right and they have lead nuclei in them. Some collisions are grazing, some collisions are head on, some collisions are halfway in between with an impact parameter that's um, half the radius. Um, and the, you, have to, you, you have to pick an observable that um, you measure that allows you to select a sample of collisions after the fact with an impact parameter in a certain range. And the, the, um, the simplest thing to use is, the, is the, the, either the total number of pions or the total energy in the pions at mid rapidity. Um, because in the head-on collisions, you make a much bigger spray of particles than in the grazing collisions. In the grazing collisions, almost all the energy and momentum keeps going down the beam pipe. Very little is scattered. In the head-on collisions, you get the most scattering. And in the ones with impact parameter 50-50, you get half as much stuff. So um, um, this observable is called centrality, and centrality is defined operationally um, 
and so um, you you don't you can't say I'm going to aim the B, I'm going to aim the ions so that they collide with an impact parameter of five femtometers, but you can pick a sample of events after the fact where the impact parameter has a probability distribution which is centered at five fermions. I hope that answers your question. So and, and don't ask me who the theorist was who talked about trying to aim the beams. So, so you you do fitting like. Uh, you have your final experiment data and you fit with the model, is that so? Or yeah, that model is called the Glauber model. Right, that model is called the Glauber model. Um, and it goes back, probably Aladi knew the Glauber model, I would guess. Because Roy Glauber uh, wrote the Glauber model paper in the 60s, I think. Um, so, so yeah, there's a very well established way of doing what I just said. Um, 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 and we can talk about it more afterwards. Uh -huh. So last question, so when you do this impact uh, collision, so there will be rotation also because... Ah, very good. So there's things I didn't talk about. Um, there'll be, there'll be angular momentum mm -hmm. in the, I, I don't want to quite say rotation because, but there will certainly be angular momentum. Uh, it, there's not enough time for it to rotate many times, but you make this, I'm trying to show you a collision here where my hands collide with a, with a non, they're not, they're not colliding like this, they're colliding like this, okay? Mm -hmm. So they collide with an impact parameter and so that naturally sets up an angular momentum but there, there's nowhere near enough time for it even to rotate all the way around once. But there is angular momentum. Um, and in fact, um, th so this is uh, called vorticity. Um, it's the vorticity of the fluid, and um, there's a coupling between vorticity and the spin of the final state hadrons, and you can measure the, the polarization of the final state, you can measure the polarization of lambda particles. So there are observables of the global polarization of lambda particles that tell you the vorticity of the fluid, and in fact, there was a headline from Rick Scienton, how many years ago, five years ago, that Rick produces the most vortical fluid ever produced. Um, so yes, we know that the fluid has vorticity. Um, we also know that there's a magnetic field because nuclei are positively charged. So if I do one of these collisions again, think about the spectators flying by, they're positive. That creates a magnetic field this way, okay? Just, you know, I just finished teaching first year electromagnetism when I have currents going by like this, that creates a magnetic field this way. So the quark gluon plasma, um, but that magnetic field disappears very quickly because the spectators fly by and are gone. So um, it's a very interesting dynamical question. Does the plasma trap any magnetic field? Okay, A um, charged fluid um, with high conductivity traps magnetic field. Um, um, the magnetic field is there at time zero the charged fluid that is there at time half a Fermi, half a Fermi after the collision, is there enough magnetic field still around that you get trapped magnetic field? That is um, something which a lot of experimentalists are looking for evidence for. I've written papers suggesting how to look for it, as have many other people, but I think it's an open question at this moment. Maybe we should take the online question, Triari. Yes. Yeah, so uh, if there's a question online, um, Sorry, before we go online, Ravindran has a question. Ravi. Nice talk, actually. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, you know, there are many observables she proposed said to, take an to, to actually test whether QGP exists or not. Is there any observable that you can think of which can actually say QGP cannot exist? It's just a negative. Oh. So, um, um, the, the um, yeah, and, and actually people have gone back and reanalyzed LEP data on E plus E minus collisions. Um, you can look at E plus E minus collisions, you look at those E plus E minus collisions that produce um, uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 pions in the final state. And you look and see whether there's any, um, azimuthal anisotropy and there's none. So um, we now know that from experimental measurements that E plus E minus collisions do not make strongly coupled fluid, even though they can make 50 particles. Um, 
Um, the interesting thing is that actually now you ask, ask about PP collisions. Um, I think in PP collisions, the, the experimental situation is subject to debate right now. There, there are people who say you can make QGP in PP collisions at high enough energy that you make hundreds of particles in a PP collision. Um, I am not persuaded of that, but um, the people who argue that point are, are, are um, worth listening to. Um, so um, it, I don't think you get QGP in PP collisions. We know you don't get it in E plus E minus collisions. That's one answer. Um, you might have been asked, were you thinking about deconfinement in your question or were you not? Okay. So um, um, I'm curious what Sianton or Sanaton would, would, would pick for an observable to um, say that we've seen, what we've seen is a deconfined fluid. Um, uh, the one I'll point to is um, uh, the one I, uh, partly because I spoke about it already, um, um, when you look at the number of JSI particles in LHC collisions, um, uh, they are copious. Um, and they're copious because um, the way you make a JSI in an LHC heavy ion collision is not you produce a C and a C bar in the same hard scattering and the fragmentation function is such that they find each other and make a JSI. That, um, which is how you make, at, at LHC energies, that's how you describe JSI production in PP. Um, so you can look at, suppose that I would um, just think of heavy ion collisions at the LHC as a superposition of PP collisions. That underpredicts the JSI production by a lot. Um, and the excess relative to that is well described just by statistical hadronization, by which I mean, um, you produce in the QGP, you produce 30 charms and 30 anti-charms. So um, every, if I'm doing the numbers right, um, 30 is uh, roughly one in a thousand. So roughly one in a thousand quarks is charm, one in a thousand anti-quarks is anti-charm. And at the end of the day, you know, you have a dance with um, 30,000 dancers. Um, um, who's dancing with whom when the lights turn on, right? That's hadronization. Um, um, there's a, it's, it's just statistics, um, what the odds are that the C finds a C bar. And that um, describes the data well. And what that's saying is that the C and the C bar are not confined into a JSI. They're diffusing randomly within the plasma. So um, this to me is a, is, a, is a very good way of seeing um, um, deconfinement. Um, um, there are others, but I think we should take the online question. Yes. Um, so let's go how to the do, online. How, how do we hear the online question? So I think they can unmute. If you can unmute and then ask your question, you can go for it. Uh, whoever it is, please, please introduce yourself also. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Brian Dolan. Um, I have a question about the, the phase diagram that you showed. Um, we know for the universe as a whole, there's a baryon asymmetry. So in the early universe, at temperatures above um, 150 MeV, that would have been a plasma. Um, what would have been the chemical potential associated with the overall body asymmetry? I, I, I guess it's essentially negligible in the scale of your diagram, but it must have been non-zero. Do, yep. do you know the number? Um, so I'm going back to the phase diagram. That's a great question. Uh, let me go back to the phase diagram. Um, so um, um, the baryon asymmetry is, as you know, it's around 10 to the minus 8. 10 to the minus 8. OK. Yes. So, so, That's MEV. Yeah. Right. So I'll, re I'll repeat the question. Um, the, in, in the early universe, in the early universe, um, there is an excess of quarks over antiquarks. Okay. If there weren't, we wouldn't be here. Um, as the quark gluon plasma of the early universe um, cools, um, um, the quarks annihilate with the antiquarks, and you end up with the microwave background radiation. That's where the, 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 you know, the, the entropy, most of the entropy of the early universe ends up in the microwave background radiation, but there's this tiny excess of quarks over antiquarks that becomes us, um, the matter that we see today. That tiny excess, um, it corresponds to a mu um, um, that is proportional to that 10 to the minus eight number, and I don't remember the proportionality constant, but it's 10 to the minus a bunch of MeV. 
Um, and so sorry, I don't know the answer to your question, but what I will say is that um, at the LHC, um, the mu baryon at the LHC is around two to three MeV, um, and this is 200 on this slide. So 200 is here, 100 is there, two to three is practically zero. Um, so it's not as small as in the early universe where it's something proportional to 10 to the minus eight, um, um, but it's close enough that the LHC quark coulomb plasma is a very good model, it's a very good proxy for the early universe. But I'm sorry, I, I, I do not know the uh, quantitative answer to your question. We can look it up. No, no, no fine, thank you. Yep. Thank Krishna for a very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all again, and uh, happy to talk further over dinner and in the next uh, couple of days. And uh, happy birthday once again to the IMSC. <laughs>